can start. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, when thinking about what I wanted to present today, I decided to be really selfish. So I'm gonna talk about something that I don't really have good solutions to, but I'm hoping we can start a conversation. Um, I've got my chat window open, so I can see if, you, if people are chatting, but you can also just unmute and talk at any point. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I was in academia, then spent the last two and a half years at Borealis AI doing more applied deep RL. Um, but now I'm back in the university, but I'd still like to figure out how the university can better help companies actually use RL. So to start off, I'm going to just kind of present at a really high level this challenges of real world reinforcement learning. That was a workshop paper last year, because I think Todd and the other authors had some interesting points. So I'm, that's the most technical section. And then I'm going to kind of throw out some ideas about how we could help the community and what might be stopping companies from using RL in the real world. So I don't need to tell this group that RL is awesome, um, but when you go to a company and say, I've got this really cool hammer, and then the company says, well, tell me about it. And you say, well, look, StarCraft, Go, Dota, and they're like, I don't care about video games. So that's a little unfortunate. Um, and they certainly don't care about uh, OpenAI 5, where you use 180 years of gameplay data each day. So for, for normal companies, that kind of compute is not achievable. So there are some real world applications. Uh, so at Borealis, we did uh, deep RL for stock trading. Um, you can think there's, there's been some success in using uh, RL to speed up computers. There's a bunch of things in finance, um, pricing, portfolio optimiz optimization. There's some stuff in robotics, but there's not a whole lot compared to supervised learning, right? There are many, many more examples where supervised learning is successfully being deployed around the world. Wrong, wrong computer, there we go. Okay, so one idea is how can we better use batch and offline training? So I was talking to Alta ML earlier this week, that's a, a local ML shop. And they were saying, look, in a, in a lot of cases, we've got a bunch of data from existing systems. You know, we, we do not want the RL agent to start exploring from scratch. We need to use this existing data. So you can think of, um, so here's an example from the Dagger paper, where a person, a person drives a car, simulated car, and then the car takes over. And the problem with learning from demonstration is once you get a little bit off the path, it's hard to recover. So if, if the agent explores a little and goes out of the middle of the road, then it never saw the human trying to turn back into the middle of the road because the human never made that mistake. So there are, ways, there are ways to get around that, but it's still difficult. So trying to figure out how to use batch and offline training and then switch it over to online training is something I'm pretty excited about. Um, so one of the things that uh, Alta ML asked me, okay, so let's say we do this offline training with an agent. How well will it perform when I let it actually go in the real system? And I don't know. Maybe some of you are, who are better with batch learning could, could help me answer that. But that seems like the kind of basic question that we need to be able to answer, that if you train offline, how well will it perform when it's, when it's actually let go in the real world? So in a lot of cases, um, there is no simulator. So when you're, when you're doing stock trading, there are simulators, but they're not very good. So when, while you're exploring, you're losing real money. Or if you've got a robot, you're really using wear, wear and tear on that robot. So you know, parallelization, parallelization is awesome but you need a simulator, or if you're deep mind, you might be able to buy 50 different uh, robots and let them all run in, in uh, parallel. So another thing that can be uh, troubling in the real world is large action spaces. So think about a movie recommender system. 
if you've got an action space, which is the size of the number of movies, that can be bad. Um, so one of the things I'm thinking about is how do you then try to uh, group those subsets of actions together? Or are there some methods that can better handle uh, large action spaces? And how do you figure out what the right number of actions even is? I'll come back to that point later. So we can also think of safety. So they, um, so for, for example, you could have a car that's exploring and it drives off a cliff. Great, you've, you've got a really good example, some really good data now, and you know never to drive off a cliff again, but you've taken an unacceptable cost. So maybe we need to have a, a manually designed controller to help make sure we don't do anything too dangerous. There are, some, there are some methods that do factor in risk and can take, uh, take those kinds of constraints into account. But I think if we're going to deploy more RL agents, we're gonna to have to be doing more of that. So one of, the, one of the things I've been struggling with is reward functions. So I'm, I was always used to, um, you know, God comes down and gives you an MDP, and then your job is to solve that MDP. And it turns out that that's not really the way it works. Um, so you can think of if, if, my, if my goal is to make as much money at the end of the day as possible, that's one possible reward function, but that's very sparse. So maybe I want to add in additional rewards that could help me learn faster. But then you might end up doing the wrong thing. So I'm not going to try to play the video here, but if you want to, you can go to it later. This is from this is the example from OpenAI where they have a uh, motorboat that's supposed to go through a course, and because of these extra rewards, it finds a reward cycle where it just starts going in loops and racking up reward. So okay, so we want to find a reward function which is ideally not sparse, and will get us. A lot, that is aligned with what we actually want, it, want our agent to do. So one thing you could do is go and ask a bunch of experts. So what is, whoops, I'm bear tracks is timing out on me. There we go. Um, so one thing you could do is go to a bunch of experts and ask them, you know, what is the right reward? And maybe, maybe you could figure that out. But you can also think of what if I have multiple users? So if I've got a if I've got an RL task for car driving and I want to trade off um, uh, time to destination with uh, fuel efficiency, different users will have different preferences. So if you've got this kind of complex or multi-objective reward function, you really need to think about how would you customize that per person. And you could also think of can I get shaping rewards from an expert? So we know that there are some types of shaping rewards that we can add in and are guaranteed not to change the optimal policy, but there might be other rewards that could possibly change the policy, but help you learn so much faster that it's worth it. So these, these are all the kinds of questions that you need to figure out before you can even start solving the problem because you've got to construct the right kind of MDP. So I mentioned this, um, already, but the multi-objective problem is, so if we come up with some kind of Pareto optimal front, then we might be able to let users select different policies. Of course, that can be difficult because you've got to let, um, uh, have a way of the user actually understanding the policy. So explainability might be part of that. And then maybe you do some kind of preference elicitation where you show different trajectories and you let people decide which one they like better. So we, we typically maximize the expected sum of discounted rewards. And the problem is we don't necessarily avoid catastrophic rewards. So um, the car crash example, you know, if, if I want to make sure that I never crash, do I set a car crash to negative 100, a negative 1,000, negative infinity? And, you know, that, Figuring out how to make sure you avoid these bad um, states is really important. Of course, you have the partial observability. So you may not be able to see the state. In fact, you only get an observation. 
So we know that DQN um, can do frame stacking or uses frame stacking, or you could use a recurrent, net, recurrent neural network to try to get around that. So there are different ways you can try to deal with um, partial observability, but it's often going to be a problem. More interesting to me, I think, is the non-stationarity. So you can think, again, with the stock market, you kind of have this concept drift where the transition function is changing over time. You could even think of the reward function changing over time. But you could also have sudden jumps. So um, every time Trump tweets something, the market may, may uh, sharply react in an unexpected way. And how do you identify that non-stationarity? How do you handle it? How do you uh, robustly um, uh, start exploring in this new environment? Or maybe how do you identify that, oh, I've seen this type of transition function before, that the market today is the same as, it, it acting the same as it was eight days ago. So I'm gonna use that model. A lot of what I was doing over the past year was looking at explainability. So I'm, I'm really excited about explainability for RL. So for one thing, it can help you with debugging. When your agent is acting in the world and it's doing something weird, then you can use explainability to try to figure out why it's doing something weird. Whether it's you misdefined the reward function, um, it's not considering some of the actions that it should, that kind of thing. From the commercial side, it's really interesting because explainability can help build trust. So you say, come use my car driving program, use my stock trading agent, and here's how it works. And you might think that explainability is, is good for building trust, but it can also actually be used to quant make quantitative decisions. So for instance, if I give you two stock trading agents, then if those agents can explain what you're, they're doing, a person might be able to better decide which uh, stock trading agent they want to use. And you could learn novel scenarios or novel um, strategies through this explanation. Another thing that I've heard from a few companies about explainability is that the, you know, so the, the research engineers go and build something and then you bring it, to, bring it to your boss and say, hey, I want to deploy this in the world. And first of all, they don't necessarily know what RL and deep neural networks are. So having something that you can use for visualization can help the higher ups understand. But also if they feel like, this goes back to the trust, if the company higher ups feel like they can understand what the agent is doing, they're more likely to say, yeah, okay, let's give it a shot, go try it. Another uh, point this paper makes is there's a lot of real time decision making. So you can think of, uh, sorry for, keep going back to the stock market, but that's what I've been thinking about for a few years. So you can have an agent that acts really fast and is not very smart, or you can have an agent which is very smart, but slow. So there's kind of this trade-off you can make where there's a range of options and all of those can be useful and make you money. But figuring out what is the speed I need to work at is going to put, um, some is going to tell you what kind of methods you can and cannot use and what kind of hardware you have to buy. But you can also think of the real problems often have delays to the sensors and the actuators. So that's something that you may need to take an account, into account, which you know, when, we're, when we're using Atari or AI Jim, that's not necessarily doing. So a summary of this paper is um, this, this table. So in the lab, we typically assume we have a perfect simulator, unless you're Rupam working on robots, um, and that's generally not true. We do lots of experimenting using CPU and GPU time. So we are exploring, we're trying new actions. We are doing hyperparameter tuning. We are trying different algorithms. We are uh, trying different architectures. And all of those cost us time, but in the real world, money, mechanical wear and tear, also reputation. So if you say, um, okay, I'm, I'm running an algorithm and now I'm gonna try something else and the, the, um, the performance is gonna dip, that might not be acceptable to a customer or a user. Also, if you, if you go and your stock trading agent does something uh, stupid, 
and the customer comes to you and said, why the heck did you sell then? And you say, oh, well, we rolled the dice and we were told to explore. Uh, sorry, you know, that, that just happens sometimes. That, that may not go over well. So that's something to consider. Okay, so that, that was kind of, I wanted to just kind of summarize this um, workshop paper to give you a sense of what some people are thinking of. Um, so now I just have two slides before we launch and hopefully launch into a discussion. So thinking about, you, you go into a company, so you, you, you just graduated from U of A, you, you're an amazing RL person. Now you go into a company and say, I've got this tool, this RL hammer, tell me, let, help me find the right nail. So one of the questions that a company will ask is, how difficult is this problem? So they tell you about a problem and then, you know, is, is that something that, first of all, can you solve it? Is that something that it's gonna take you two weeks, two months, two years? Well, that's kind of important to know. So thinking about the state space and action set, that's gonna obviously have a big impact on how difficult this can be to learn. Are the rewards defined? So we talked about this earlier, when if you've got a very well-defined reward function that is not sparse, you're in much better shape than if you go need to talk to a bunch of people, figure out what the reward is, and then maybe iterate where you come up with a policy, bring it to the experts, and they're like, oh, no, you, you shouldn't be doing that. You're, you missed out on this. A big one is, is there a simulator? Is it realistic? So if you have a simulator, which is OK, but not perfect, maybe you can do some sim to real, like is often done in robotics. But if you don't have a simulator, what are you going to do? Well, maybe you can use existing data, either from another agent or human. So there's lots of, um, there are lots of processes in companies which are automated that are collecting data. And now if you wanna say, okay, you, you've got this thing that's working, I think RL can, can improve on that, but we're gonna bootstrap off of that data. You can also say, well, I'm going in and trying to replace this existing process in a company, or maybe invent a new process, um, but I wanna use RL. And there's a bunch of smart people in that company who've got pretty good ideas about how we might want to bias that agent. So how do you trade off trying to get that human bias to help you learn faster with making sure you're not just um, copying what the human would do and limiting your asymptotic performance? And I, I hinted at this last one before, which I'd be interested in, in talking with those of you who understand batch and offline learning better, where if you learn uh, on a data set, and then want to actually have the agent take over and start, um, start using its policy in the real world and possibly exploring. How do you do that? How do you know when you have enough offline data that you can uh, have high, high, uh, high chance of performing at at least some level of competence? Now, another, another question, you know, this isn't so much for us, but if you go to a company and you're, you're telling them about this, this uh, awesome RL tool, and they say, that's great. Um, I've got someone who took the MOOC and maybe even read Rich and Andy's book, but is that gonna be enough? You know, can, can my company succeed in solving a real R RL task without having to hire a professor, without having to hire someone with a PhD? Now, there's also the question, so more on the business side. So trying to figure out, do I want to invest in this technology? So one of the things you can think about is, is this a, if the business thinks this is a good, uh, a good problem for, to, to hire an RL person to solve. So one thing is how expensive are fail, failures? If exploring is very expensive, this might not be the right tool. They're going to immediately think, okay, uh, I've got a state-of-the-art method. I've got my current way of doing it. How much will RL give me? Is it going to be a 1% improvement, a 10%? How do, you, how do you estimate that? Now, in addition to saying, well, I, I just saved you $100,000 this year, you can also think of second-order effects. So, for instance, if um, you're, let's say, a, a landlord, 
and you get RL to help uh, optimize your HVAC system. That may help you get more customers into your, into your building because look, we're, we're so cool. We're doing this AI stuff. Isn't that awesome? It's going to be even more in financial sectors. If you can come out and say, well, we're the first ones to use RL for this, that may bring more, more customers to you. But thinking about, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to give businesses some kind of checklist to de-risk RL? So, so for instance, if you've got a problem, could you first start with the simplest thing? So could you start with a shallow RL learner using Sarsa with tile coding? Um, because the, the question is, in a lot of cases, if you're, a company wants to try something out, they want to de-risk as much as possible. They want to understand what's the minimum thing I could do to have some kind of confidence that um, some kind of confidence that this is going to work. Yeah, and Craig makes a good point about HVAC systems that you could be trying to make people happy, or you could be reducing ener energy um, and making people cold. Um, another thing is, can I, I mentioned this before? How do I estimate my online performance? What if the problem is non-stationary? Is that something that the business needs to worry about? Well, if, if it's just a stationary problem, maybe you can just have a really smart person sit down and hand code a solution. But if it's changing over time, you're probably gonna want a learning solution. How does this improve the bottom line? A thing I've been struggling, or yeah, struggling with is thinking about how do you set up an interactive environment? So. Let's say um, a company wants to automate this uh, system and you come and say, okay, I've got this RL agent. What kind of, uh, how much effort will it take to get the plumbing working? So this is exactly the kind of thing that a software engineer uh, needs to think about. What kinds of, um, how many GPUs do I need to make it run fast enough? And if I have an agent that works, how do I then productionize it? So how do I ensure that it's got 99.9% um, .9 uptime, that it's got a certain uh, response time, that if a bunch of clients suddenly join, I can still scale to them. Another question that a business will say, well, what's the, what's the best algorithms to start with? You know, because it's, I don't know, I feel overwhelmed by the amount of new deep RL algorithms that are coming out. It seems like on a daily basis. And there's no way a non-expert is going to be able to keep up with that. So trying to think about what other kinds of barriers are there. What can we as academics provide to other people, to companies, to help them use this awesome tool? So this is something that I want to, to think about and figure out how we can provide more value. And so that we can say a year or two from now, now, they're, they're, right now, there are some deployed RL agents. And if we were able to say, well, U of A put out these checklists and talked with these companies and did some consulting and look at all these additional RL agents that are now doing things, that would be pretty cool. The final point I'll make is that when we're thinking about what to do research on, we typically focus on video games. And like I was saying at the beginning, um, you know, we're, we're spending millions of cycles, well, many, many cycles, lots of money, um, lots of emissions on solving video games. And maybe we can start think of starting to think of more realistic settings. So for instance, last year's paper on climate change problems, there's a bunch of RL problems in there. And if I'm going to be spending all this compute on solving problems, why not focus on something that's a little more realistic? Okay, so that was my presentation. Now I'm hoping that people, that we can start a discussion to try to figure out, first of all, I'd be interested if other people um, think this is a reasonable goal, something that academia should be doing, but also if people have ideas of how we could do this. And this is very, I think this is very relevant for all the students here because the more RL we have working in the real world, the easier it will be for them to get really good jobs. Hey, Matthew. Hi. 
yeah yeah great presentation and uh, yeah it, it, this resonates very well with me uh, many of the points that you mentioned especially the human factor uh -huh. the human factor here involved is in the industry in the end we will have to champion uh, our hammer we'll have to speak for it and we'll have to convince people right so many of the tools that you described they are about like how you're going to convince them this is a good thing to do and some of them are kind of like a compromising from the purest form of rl that we want to pursue and that makes sense and but i i want to make this comment about the human factor part that is that we can also try not to compromise too much by promoting by by thinking like what is the promise of rl and selling that to the business side so I think could, you talk, they, could you talk a little bit about the the compromise that you're talking about make a give a concrete example for example using human demonstration all the way to use, doing seem to real as well as um using batch learning right so those are uh on the academic side, I, I would say that our to keep our, uh, the our purest goal intact, we want something that is less and less human dependent. Can use can use batch learning, human demonstration, and seem to real if they are provided, but are not dependent on them. They are to give, you know, like a head start, but. Asymptotically, as the business runs for years and years, if you look at that horizon, you cannot keep depending on people uh, that way. This human dependence kind of defeats the purpose. So you want something that's automated and reduces the dependence on human on and on. Yeah, and, and asymptotically, it can actually take care of itself. So that is the purest form. So how do we keep that intact on the business side? Seems like it's pretty hard. So one way I tried, and I at least didn't fail. <laughs> I wouldn't say I succeeded uh, fully. It, it was an uphill battle, but at least uh, I, I had um, all the way to the CEO of the company uh, on my side is by saying the same thing again and again, showing them the Oh, not all, all the way to CEO, actually the investors, board members and investors, because I, as I was saying something that sounded like crazy, they put me up to the investors to, okay, I cannot say what you are saying. How about you say to the investors, say, see if that works. And it worked at least for some investors to, to say what is the promise of RL? What, what, is, what is the promise of RL asymptotically in the long run? So businesses, we know that uh, famously don't care about long long run, but some will, right? So I think uh, that's one way to not compromise too much, show, show the promise. Then, you know what happens? Some of them say that, okay, exploration just makes sense. And they do exploration all the time. They do exploration all the time because they have, uh, in a, like the exploration not in rl sense but in exploring ideas they have one after another like new product versions right so uh future versions and then uh one is running and then they allocate five percent of uh, of their robots to try the newer version they do do that all the time and performance does deep so the best thing i think uh, uh we figured out is to be honest and say what is the deal here and say that, okay, this is how much we estimate the performance can be. How do you feel about that? And when you become honest, actually the clients, they say, that, oh, okay, the, the news is we also do exploration. See, it does totally make sense for us. Let's do 5% exploration. So uh, I think that's a good way to go. Uh, and, and, and in addition, it is very important to also focus on the head start, right? So even you're not gonna probably deploy a completely uh, random agent so you need some head start so uh, yeah those are uh, something we should explore as well but this human factor is so important and it is not it is not just about the business side we do that all the time in academia we 
do marketing for our papers. We do have to do that, right? We did some work. Why wouldn't we talk about our work, promote our work? It is the same thing over there. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Cool. Thanks, Rupan. Uh, so I had a follow-up question about uh, uh, what Rupam just mentioned and as well as uh, something that you brought up in the talk is that um, so we don't, like as people in academic labs, we don't really think about this business side, right? So this is something um, that was new to us and uh, I think very insightful. And one of the things that you mentioned was that uh, uh, you need to give some kind of, you know, estimates of how well uh something this new thing would do over something that they already have in trust right so how do we go about doing that given that things that we have tried are in like maybe grid worlds or like some video games but let's say stock markets right so how would you convince or give the company some estimates as to how well you would do over their existing methods given the other problems that you mentioned, that you don't really have a good simulator of uh, the stock market, if you even have one, and how realistic it is, and so on and so forth. So do you have any thoughts about that? Um, so yeah, that's exactly what I want to solve. And I don't have great thoughts. I mean, you could you could think of saying, well, let's, let's do a take data from their existing approach, do some batch learning, and make sure we can at least learn on that, that will give us some confidence. Um, but that's that's a big, big question. How long will it take to define the MDP in the right way? What, what will those learning curves look like? Are we talking about days to reach good performance? A year? I don't know a good way to estimate those. Does anyone, but, but I think if we could, the better we can do that, definitely the better off we are. We've got a lot of really experienced people on this call. Does anyone else have a suggestion to how to how to tackle this problem? Okay, it sounds like really good future work then. Awesome. Again, again, like my I, I my answer would be that like uh, uh, use the human factor bargain. You don't know, but say that. Do, do you allow some percentage of exploration and use that to estimate it and then come up with the number rather than like cooking up something based on your model, like have the real experiment all the way to the deployment, if that's affordable. Yeah, if, if, if they will say, we believe, we believe in RL, we'll let you try it, then yes. I guess I'm, I'm skeptical that we'll be able to uh, convince companies that it's worth trying unless we can give them a concrete, some kind of um, estimate of how long it will take to learn and what, what will the performance be. So, so, in the, so to follow up on that, I have seen like in, in startups, like they try, like in basically in the Bay Area, they develop so many different prototypes, like numerous of them, right? They do exploration of ideas so much. I, I, I don't quite get like why, maybe the big companies are more resistant. But the startups, they are like, it is built into them to try different things, right? So this is just another crazy idea. That's probably the, the, the problem that will not be seen as the one of the best ideas, but I don't see quite, at least for startups in the Bay Area, I don't quite see the problem of like convincing people to try another crazy idea. I have seen so many prototypes being tried and no one, no one complains about that. Like try it, fail, move on. I have one idea for impact. Um, this is Adam. Um, so I've had a lot of conversations with Huawei. They're a giant company that basically does everything. I think they're a real joy to work with. So if you haven't worked with them, you should explore it. It's really fun. Um, but one thing I've noticed with them is they've got all these problems, and they've got money, and they've got engineers, and they have interests. But the kind of default failure mode that they, them and other probably large companies is that they look, they look at, they rank order their hardest problems, and then they say, can RL solve my first hardest problem? Can it solve my second hardest problem? And so on and so on and so forth. And often those problems are like really hard, like they're, they're like problems that are just hard optimization problems where 
there's dangerous exploration, like, you know, in inventory management, exploring about, you know, not sending the inventory just as an exploratory action is stupid. Um, and so those things are probably well treated with like classic methods, like approximate dynamic programming and stuff. But what I've always encouraged them is, is to say, especially in a larger company, you have millions of problems. Let's go hunting for the ones that RL is just embarrassingly good fit for. And so like when I'm thinking about it, like when I think of, you know, industrial control problems, there are some industrial control problems that, like I said, have a, an unsafe exploration problem. But then there are others that are well designed and the engineers have thought about how people would try to ruin the system and so they put in safety, safety protocols. And it's actually, some of those cases, it's not really even an unsafe exploration problem. So we should be hunting for these problems that RL is like a, a clear win for and avoid those ones that are just happen to be the hardest problem the company has. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so I've been having problems with the mic. Uh, so Rupam brought up the, the, the whole idea too of short versus long-term thinking in business. And I'm wondering if given in the current situation with COVID and the economy and that kind of stuff, if we're gonna see an, I would expect an increasing shift to even be even more short-sighted in thinking, people looking for quick wins and that kind of stuff. So uh, given that, I, I think that maybe what Ad Adam's saying um, makes sense, uh, as well as what Rupam was saying about, about focusing on um, how do we incorporate what we already know into the system. Like that should be maybe a real focus of what we do is how do we bring in human knowledge to, to put that into the system as, as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. Um, in thinking, in, for those of you who haven't worked with Alta ML, they've got this kind of interesting approach where they they go and try to uh, go work with a company for relatively cheap, try to get a quick win, and then build trust so that they can work on more interesting and harder problems. So if to, to echo uh, those things that were just said, if we can, if we've got these kind of guidelines. And may, maybe most of us already have these ideas in our head, what makes an RL problem easy? But if we've got these guidelines and can go out and find, pick an easy problem that we know RL can do well, solve it quickly, and then after you get that quick win, then we can go for the more interesting. Hi, Matt, and everyone else. Can you guys hear me? Yes. So um, just about that, uh, I have a thought, um, like, how about we take a step back and look at how supervised learning entered the industry? Because you mentioned um, in your third slide that supervised learning has already been largely deploy deployed in the industry. And I wonder how did that start it? Um, so maybe they start with something simple, just with using either linear regression or decision tree and they started there and defined the problem that's solvable for supervised learning. So maybe people who have that kind of experience can provide us some sort of guidelines, say how, how, how do we start and what is the, the common uh, thing between RL and supervised learning and what is the thing that RL has that's unique we should uh, further consider. So I think maybe there are lessons we could learn just from the supervised learning community. Nice. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I wonder too if maybe there's some, you know, there's we have a tendency to to look for for big problems, things like robot control. Robot control looks really cool and it's really hard, but there, I think like there's some other simpler uh, domains out there. Maybe just things like you know, controlling the PID parameters of, of some motor. And, you know, in the short term, that doesn't seem like a win. You can just, why well, you would just pick values and, and you tune it and, and so on. But when you think about something that's actually deployed in industry that's expected to run nonstop continually for years, and some of those parameters that you start to get wear in these kind of things, that's maybe a situation where RL can really come in and just kind of keep things in tune. And that's not a difficult problem to work on. Right, it's like the first step should be setting a reasonable expectation for RL. Because I think there, uh, just by how I feel, is people tend to have a very high expectation for what RL can do. They're just saying, uh, oh, RL is, a, is great and the agent can 
explore or exploit on their own. They're supposed to be super automatic, but this is not the kind of expectation that supervised learning would get. So probably we are uh, we don't have to only focusing on those super super difficult problems, and we're hoping that RL can magically solve it. But we can start from something uh, like what Craig just said, starting from something that's we know it's solvable, but still a bit challenging. And then step by step, we can we can uh, take deeper into that into that road. Because we know that supervised learning alone is gonna is not gonna give you a super awesome stock trading algorithm. And we know that's impossible. And why do we think RL definitely can do it? That's that's something to think about. Well, I mean, one of the, the factors that comes into play is the infrastructure. I, you can actually do really well with dead simple models. And a lot of industrial models are dead simple, right? It's surprising once you dig into it what a big company is doing underneath the hood. Um, and like one of the, the infrastructural needs for reinforcement learning that you don't see with a lot of supervised learning problems is the data stream. The data pipeline that any organization that's hoping to use reinforcement learning methods or continual learning methods uh, is much more specialized. And you can't do the simple, I'm collecting a batch of data from whatever it is, pre-processing it, dumping it into whatever my training system is, and then deploying the model. Um, and that can actually be surprisingly challenging to do if you've got a large organization that has millions of users and you don't want to destabilize your service. So one, uh, Cam here, one way to think about problems to go after, because I think one of the things that happens is we come from academia and we're used to like, we want to have like great results. We want to have something that's like 99% accurate or, you know, looks like it's doing incredibly. And one thing kind of like going back to what Adam mentioned earlier is not just find a like small problem, but find something that literally could not be solved without using RL and is enough of a problem that if it only works half the time, it's useful to the person. So are useful to the company. So find like a situation that's like so bad right now can't be solved by supervised learning, is small, and just like a, any any improvement could be useful. And so I would look at those, because then you have a system that can learn and improve over time and you have proof points and that type of thing. The tough part is if we start from a supervised learning perspective, we're always gonna, and like problems that, that those types of methods can solve at all, we're, the supervised learning methods are always gonna win out right off the bat. Um, or almost always. Uh, so there's almost not a point in going down that road um, unless you're able to either get a huge investment from a company up front, like Rupam mentioned, like a really, really long-term thing, or find something where like any sort of crappy solution in this non-stationary environment that the only way something works is by learning online. Uh, any improvement there is helpful. Start from there and then you'll be able to have something that you know, both help solve a problem and, you know, can continue to improve. And one, one thing I want to uh, piggyback on is as engineers or researchers, we, we may not know the right, what problems there are. So we're talking about how do we identify a good problem, but so the way, the way Borealis worked is there were program managers and business developers who would go into RBC and find good problems. And if they don't understand what RL is, then they're going to have a lot more trouble understanding what where this hammer could even be applied. So one of the questions that I have now that we've brought up a lot of these issues is how do we as students or, or, or even supervising students, how do we change the way we do things to I guess encourage this like like Matt you brought up you know we we tend to train on video games right now that's that's kind of the state of the art um how do we encourage people our students ourselves to move away from those because in some senses those are easy it's easy to work in a grid world and we can learn a lot from a grid world I'm not I'm not dissing at that but I feel like we tend to stop there or I tend to stop there because I can publish the paper and I can move on with my life um, so what do we do to keep keep working towards doing something that's useful? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, so 
my my personal opinion, so I, I completely agree. I do a bunch of stuff in video games because that's the way you publish papers. One of the things we could do better as a community is celebrating more complex domains, especially real world domains. So I was just um, helping with uh, Ichikai reviews and I had a few applications papers and they got ripped apart because there wasn't enough uh, fundamental breakthroughs. I personally thought that just getting RL to work on these really complicated things was pretty awesome, but the reviewers did not think so. So part of it could be a shift into recognizing that applied RL is a useful thing for us to be spending time on. And I think that's a great question, Craig. I mean, organizations also have to give us data if they want us to work on these sorts of problems, right? Um, so let's say recommendation systems. People want to use reinforcement learning for recommender systems uh, or want research in that sort of applied area, then there have to be sufficient data sets. From my understanding, uh, most of the data sets are actually quite small. And of course, because like, how do you even begin to build something like a simulator for that, you would need to, if you were going to do research for that sort of thing, it would be highly specialized to whomever's problem you're, you're actually working on. Um, like without having actual organizations reach out and put in the effort to develop systems to make their problems good domains, you're probably not gonna see much progress on these industrial applications. Yeah, because it's, it's so much easier. I, my guess is that it's much easier to convince a company to release a data set than to release a simulator. Yep. <laughs> Anything that has any proprietary information or like personal privacy issues, good luck. <laughs> One of the other things that has been helpful and something that I don't have an answer to, but something to think about is if you look at domains that now deep learning is being used in a lot, there was these challenges for years that were essentially real world challenges. So they were either uh, like NLP, some sort of NLP data set, um, some sort of voice data set or some sort of vision data set. Uh, and so inherently some of the techniques being worked on there ended up being uh, kind of real world maybe by accident. So one of the things to think about too is if there's something from our lab that could be a real world-ish thing that inherently is gonna both be a great testing thing, test set for, or test bed for RL, the RL work that we do, and also is inherently going to be real world. I know Rupon, we had talked at one point about like, I don't know, like a beanbag toss or you know something like that. Um, but inherently, these are you know hard RL challenges. At the same time, you know, turn around and most of the things are going to get be able to be used right away. You know, in the in the wild. But I don't have any actual recommended test beds for it. <laughs> hey, Matt. Hey, Rich. How about how about Andy? Thanks for the talk. Um, what about the obvious thing of um, High frequency trading, so it has to be sensitive to uh, online, non-stationary changing situations, and uh, you've been thinking about the stock market. Yeah. Why don't so we do it to uh, yeah do little micro trades? Yeah. So my my immediate uh, response is I don't have the money to do that. Um, but you could you if if you are only making smallish trades, you could still um, basically just simulate. You know, you say, okay, I, I'm going to just pretend I bought this stock at this price, this many shares, and then just use that data to to track what, how you're doing. Yeah, I, there's really no reason to to actually play with real money in that case. I th I think there are some simulators out there, although I. Uh, Matt, as you know, um, obviously when you trade large volumes of things, then that can affect the actual price. Um, 
So you'd have to make that assumption or at least re recognize that that was a, an assumption you were building in to, mm -hmm. if you're not going to actually trade money. Yep. Another one other problem with the stock market is if for a given market, you get one trace, right? It's, it's hard to, unless you've got a simulator, you, you only have the price that actually happened. You can't go and run multiple trials with different random seeds. All right. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Rich. Well, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Martha is doing something with Huawei, which I think is a really, <clears throat> a really good uh, meets that criteria. You know, the uh, the network routing and um, and uh, what's it congestion control is a very suitable one because. You know, you're routing your your packets around. You're controlling the controlling the traffic, and and it has a number of features that are very desirable. That's it's, it's not a you can experiment. You can route different ways. It's not not a tragedy if you get it wrong. It just things slow down, or maybe something gets gets dropped. Things get dropped all the time, and uh, you want to be sensitive to online performance. You want to be sensitive. You want to change all the be changing all the time. Uh, you want to you want to adapt and customize to the particular day. Uh, there are problems where you've 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 cheap cheap decisions, lots of feedback, and it's you know it's too much of a bother to to um, for a person to get involved. I also think of like you know something on your on your phone, the dimming of your of the screen on your phone is something that should be customized to each user in different situations. It's cheap. It should be interactive. It should be customized to the person. These these things are uh, lots of user interface ones like that. Uh, I just want to mention some of those other possibilities. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I need to learn more about network routing. It sounds like it's a pretty cool problem. On, on that note, actually, too. That is a really cool problem. And there was, um, I was approached, or uh, some poster session at RLDM, uh, the last RLDM, someone from, oh, whatever agency in Canada manages bandwidth allocations and stuff. And they were they were looking at a similar problem too. Like, how do we apply RL to dynamically allocate bandwidth, or, or spectrum was what it was, spectrum to different entities on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, and that kind of stuff. So this is a totally relevant problem that RL is, is well-suited for. Nice. And they, so uh, they recognized that RL was a good tool, and then they can, came to RLDM? Yeah, that's right. Or they were hoping it was anyway. They were hoping it was a good tool. <laughs> All right, I think we should wrap up. We're about out of time. Um, but uh, if people have ideas or want to chat with me, please just drop me a line. Um, I think we are the best place to learn RL. I think U of A is the leader in, in this technology. And anything that we can do to better get RL out in the hands of the masses would be amazing. So thinking about what we could do to support Amy and their outreach, or what materials we can make, or what research we should be doing to make it easier for other people to use RL. Um, these are all things that are interesting to me, and hopefully we'll have a chance to work on some of these together. So thank you so much for listening today, and I hope to talk to some of you more about this later. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, everyone, uh, join me in thanking Professor Matt Taylor for this great talk. And you all also welcome him to the department. Thank you so much. All right, bye, everyone. <laughs>